Yeah, it's right here. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, so you might wonder why I have a stool. Um, I don't want to faint. And I uh, feel a little bit uh, tipsy this morning. And so I should tell you that we were in Nicaragua. We went up to a, a beautiful place. In fact, that is a picture of looking at the cross, which I cannot remember the Spanish wording for it, but it's overlooking the city of Henetega. Absolutely stunning. The words or the picture does no justice to how beautiful of a view that is. I believe that picture was taken by Kara, so thank you for that picture. And uh, it was amazing. And, and as we sing Draw Me Deeper, which indeed was the uh, theme of our week, that, uh, that was beautiful. It gave me chills just now hearing that song that we sing every single night of their mission trip. But I can't even begin to tell you what it sounded like on top of that mountain right there, overlooking the city of Hinatega, where they had a large gazebo type of auditorium thing that had a really angled roof and it had amazing acoustics. <clears throat> and we stood around a pole in the middle looking up and we sang this song as the deer, draw me deeper, Lord. Deeper, Lord, in you as we overlook the city of Hinatega. And um, I almost brought to tears even thinking about it. It was emotional in the moment. It's emotional looking back on it and what a powerful thing. Now, I will tell you, that it wasn't that long after singing that song that we were down on the way back down the mountain and I sort of passed out. <clears throat> I guess I had too much. Um, and so I, that is something I could share if you, uh, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, maybe some of you have heard it, I would be glad to share later, but I think I'm okay. Uh, please don't worry too much about me, but I'm still feeling pretty weak and I'm still trying to get over it and I started feeling it a little bit this morning and I realized I don't want to pass out on the stage. And so, excuse me for having a stool. It's just helping me to be able to not overexert myself this morning. Um, as you can see, this picture, this picture is showing Hinatega. And it's truly, if you look down in the valley at the, at the village or the town, the city of Hinatega, which is quite a large city for Nicaragua's population, um, it, it definitely is bigger than you think it is when you get there. You can tell that... You, it is surrounded by mountains. There are mountains on all four sides, and you're truly just in the valley. Maybe they're not the Rocky Mountains, and I know that they're not the highest mountains in the world by no means, but it's absolutely breathtaking. Every shade of green you could ever see in Nicaragua is just absolutely stunning. And so we were there, and I, I kept on thinking about it, and we actually sang these songs several times. We, I kept on thinking as the mountains surround Jerusalem. You know that song. We also sing many times that we shall assemble on the mountain. And I don't know, there was something about singing those words and, and being in that setting which just brought something real to it. It just brought it to life of, of Jesus' words being spoken. And that brought me to mind of something else that Jesus spoke. Well, it was also on a hill or a mountain, right? And that is Jesus gives his famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in, and in that sermon, he challenges people to think through what it looks like to serve Jesus. He, he talks about this idea of, hey, you think that the successful and the rich and the ones that are honored, you think that they're the ones that are blessed by God. But I tell you, now blessed are the poor. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecuted. He goes on to say, you've heard that it was said that you shall not murder. I tell you that if you even hate your brother, you've committed murder. He says, hey, you've heard that you shouldn't divorce. You have heard that you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look at someone and lust after them, then you've already violated that law. And so Jesus' words in all of this, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, is just turning on its head what the people would have expected. It's turning on the head what we expect. And we get to Matthew chapter 6, and we had just went through the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is this unequivocal idea that our trust is only, only belongs to Jesus, only belongs to God the Father. Father, your will be done. It's your kingdom. 
And now we get to Matthew 6, and it's almost as if Jesus is saying, if you believe all of those things, if you're still with me, if you're okay with hearing all of what I've challenged you to do, then here's what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. That money is not the main goal. That our treasure is in heaven. It's not here on earth. And so David read the first part, but I'd like to read the the latter part of that, starting in verse 25, and that looks pretty small. I apologize. I'm going to read after my piece of paper here. This is coming from the New Living Translation. To continue what David started, it says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add even a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. I could stop the sermon right there. (laughs) I don't think I can say it better than Jesus just said it. But I will throw some context into that on how I see that in our life, in my experience. And I'm young, and you might have a different experience, but I I look at those words, and we can go to the next slide here. Um, Our reaction to the words of Jesus, and you see two little images I just threw up there. That's a pretty good job of explaining my normal reaction. And that is, I don't know, how many of you would raise your hand to say you are a worrier in this room? Not a warrior, a worrier. I worry. I worry about worrying. (laughs) I stress myself out for all types of reasons, some of which I'm pretty sure are not real. (laughs) I look at these words and I say, that's nice, Jesus. That sounds great. Have you lived my life? Do you know what it costs to live in 2024? When uh, rent is more affordable than buying a home, and yet my rent's not cheap? When I child care is expensive, when going to the grocery store, they tell you, my doctor, which is, you know, pretty, you know, he goes here, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, when, uh, when, you know, doctors tell you you need to eat healthy, but then I go to the store and I look at the healthy items and I go, well, I can't afford that. But then again, I can't afford not to. And I don't know what to do. When I look around me and realize life's complicated. There's so many things that are hard. Um, economically, it's hard. I look around us and I realize our nation definitely has made some moral choices that I certainly don't agree with. I look around me and, and I'm not making a political statement, but can we all agree that we need to pray for this country? It wasn't exactly comforting the other night. (laughs) And I worry. And I sit here and go, God, how are you going to do this? How are you going to make our nation serve you? How is the church going to thrive in this world? And I have the best of intentions, right? Or at least I think so. 
I sit here and go, but God, I want to serve you more. And in order to serve you more, I need more money. It's, but you can make the argument, right? Like you can make the argument of, well, God, if I had more money, then I would say, well, God, I can give more. I can do more. I can be able to afford more. And I go down that rabbit trail and I get myself worrying about everything around me. And I've lost the point of Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom. He didn't say that his kingdom required a certain amount of money. He didn't say that his kingdom required for you to be secure in everything around you. He said just seek his kingdom. And he'll add his righteousness to you. And he will give you what you need. If he can clothe the flowers of the field, if he can allow the birds to fly, then why do we think that God's not looking after us? Now, I'm going to tell you, though, that that might look different for everybody. And sometimes it's hard. We look at around us and go, well, God, why does that person have more? Like, I work just as hard. I'm just as smart. If God, if you would have given me that opportunity, if I would have grown up in this home, if I didn't have this obstacle, if I didn't have this health issue... But I will tell you that God's not asking for your input into his plan. <laughs> he has a plan for you. And some of us might be called for a tougher way of living out that plan than others. And I'll come back to that in a, in a second. But as I, as I look on this, in my better moments, I'll look back and I go, well, at least I don't have it as bad as somebody else. And Hey, we're, not, we're imperfect. That's the first step. At least I can at least appreciate the people around me and even my family. I'm like, well, hey, you know, me and Kelsey both have good jobs. That's, that's good. Better than some. Um, my kids are healthy. Amen to that. Amen. I know some parents who do not have that blessing in their life. And I can look around me and go, I might be sitting on a stool here, but I had an amazing care from a doctor while I was in Nicaragua, from one of our own here. And I am okay, and I can work, I can get myself in shape and, and fix some things because we do live in a country with amazing, however expensive it is, it's amazing health care. <laughs> right? <laughs> We're blessed. And I can look around me to even my friends and neighbors and family and go, well, they might not have as much as I do. And I promise you, if you do that, you can always find someone who has it worse than you. And I think you're on the right path, right? Because you are at least thinking about other people. But as you see on the slide, and it's really hard to, to skip this, that we went to Nicaragua, where I think it turned on the head every idea of poverty you might have. And some of you have been blessed to have gone to a country like this, so you know exactly what we're talking about. Kelsey remarked the entire time we were there, I should tell you that Kelsey, 10 years ago, served a couple of years in Uganda in the... Um, Kampala is the city, and in the slums of Kampala, and she kept on remarking that it wasn't to the extent of Kampala, or at least how she remembers it, but it was the same thing, right? It's the same type of poverty. It was just like you could literally substitute this street for one of those streets at, in places in Nicaragua. And I, I will tell you that having been there, it's so different than just hearing it, so I feel bad. I'm telling you, and by word, but I'm telling you that it no matter what people would have told me, it wasn't preparing me for what I saw and witnessed there and how much that meant to me and what that did to me. And as I look, you'll, you'll see the two pictures. I, I will full disclosure, go back to the last picture. Um, if you go back one. Uh, okay. That, okay. The top picture is a picture we took. The bottom picture, uh, I couldn't find another one that really did what I was wanting. And so that is a uh, photo from the internet, the second one, that is very photogenic there. But it does show you just a little bit of the poverty. Uh, the top picture, I don't know how zooming in you can get, because I'm sorry, I didn't make that larger. That is some type of, of living dwelling. I think that had mainly animals in it, but it was a part of a larger area that resembled everything in Nicaragua. That is, it was thrown together with whatever materials you had. It was a blessing if you had the blocks that we worked so hard for. By the way, um, the, uh, the girls are going to tell you later that there is a little bit of a challenge on the girls. There were two groups of girls, one of which made the most per hour, 
and the other made the most total. So uh, there's a, just to let you know, the answer is yes, they both won. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, and the guys are really hurt that they're not in this conversation. <clears throat> <laughs> but regardless, we made those blocks, which I want to say that we're, we were told that it was about a do, Amer one American dollar per block. We made those blocks because most a latrine, which is a toilet, you know, um, the toilet area, which is outside, um, you could make those with, I want to say, about 160 blocks, which is roughly what you could do as a group in one day, or at least our group. <laughs> I think the Nicaraguan guys could do it a lot faster, um, but our group could do about that in one day. If a house would take many more than that, and we're talking about a very modest dwelling, right? If you were to drive around Hinatega or drive into Hinatega, you would see all types of buildings. Some have no roof. Some don't really have walls. And others have some combo of all of the above, but it doesn't look like anything you've seen here. Even in the poorest community, at least as of a few years ago, with San Benito, San Benito Texas, which is in the border area, um, where I got to stay for three months when I was younger, um, I want to say in that time, that was the poorest community per capita in the United States. I'm telling you that that would have been a rich community in Nicaragua. So even our worst area of the United States doesn't hold a candle to some of the communities you'll see out there. You'll be driving along and you'll find a church or a building that doesn't have plumbing. And even if it does have plumbing, the water, we all know the water was not safe to drink. Um, we had to have our bottles or at least the approved five-gallon things that came from the mission. It's sad, though, to drink the water in front of people who don't have the access to that water. That was rough. You would see cows everywhere and ant livestock everywhere that look like they're about to die, that are just starving or at least sick. So you don't eat the meat there, at least not the meat that is not approved or doesn't come from the right place because you can get sick. And then you're there, and we went to this one church, and I don't want to tell too many stories, but I want to save it for July 14th, so I'm really just talking about my experience this year and not anybody else's. But on July 14th, or, um, sorry, one of the times we went, we went to a church and played with kids, and they had no electricity, no plumbing. It was dark inside. Uh, there was a latrine outside, but it was uh, super muddy to get to it. We would all be going, what in the world? We saw so many people riding motorcycles, but <laughs> I have never experienced this in my life. I think at one time I saw four people on a motorcycle. Like mom, dad, kid, and baby. No helmet. Going 50 miles an hour. I've been told that that's nothing compared to what other people have seen on motorcycles. I'm really amazed that you can fit that many people on a motorcycle. I elaborate because of this. You would think that if I told you all of that and I said nothing else, you would think these people must be the most miserable, hopeless, dejected people in the world, or at least communities like that, right? And maybe, maybe there were. I'm not going, people are people. We're human. I'm sure people do feel that way there. But I'm telling you right now, the people we met, the people we got to talk to, they were so happy. They were content. They were proud of showing us their home. Go to the next slide. Um, the top picture is Chris and Jill legit drawing water from a real well. No, not an not a automatic pump, but like you lower the bucket down and figure out how to fill the thing with water. Um, the second picture on the top corner is um, a latrine. I can't see very well from here, but I think that's Naomi. Um, sorry if it's not. I really can't see very well here. But the very bottom is what I really want to point out. And this is um, Renato, which is the older gentleman in the picture, and his family, including, with the red cap, his son, Juan Carlos. This probably impacted me more than anything else throughout the week. We went to their home. We built water filters. We actually, the, um, I didn't really have a whole lot to do with it, but a group, one of our groups um, did, or mo a couple of our groups did a lot of that latrine. Um, they built it from the, I believe, the ground up. And I believe at the end of the week it was finished. And so Naomi is holding the door there. 
Um, it doesn't have the tin on there yet, but that's the frame of the door that will be going on that latrine. And that'll be a second latrine for the property because they have a church there, which is also a school, and they need more bathrooms, so two bathrooms, for all the kids and for that entire family. That family um, lives in that home which does not have a shower or a bathtub, or at least the way you think of a shower or a bathtub. They do not have what I would call a regular looking home, other than it is covered, it has a roof. Go to the next slide though. That's their floor. I, I really don't know, that makes it look good right there. That is a mixture of concrete and dirt. Uh, I'm not gonna call it a concrete floor and I'm not gonna call it a dirt floor except it's a hybrid. The cool thing though is, I love this Kels, we need to do this. The cool thing is you can track in all the mud you want. It's fine. <laughs> Love it. Kelsey could never complain at me for having a dirty home. It just fits in. <laughs> Bad thing, though, is I'm pretty sure that's not the most sanitary thing in the world to have. Yet, they have kids. They run in, run out. Life is normal. And I'm telling you, Renato and his family were proud to show us that home. And there was no even hint of they were embarrassed. Renato had rose to coffee. So if you're in a blessed with someone who bought you a coffee bag this week, um, then that is from that gentleman that we just saw. He rose coffee and he sells it to the mission. It was amazing to see how much joy and happiness they have in their life. All they could talk about was every time they would say a good thing, which is an amazing story, and I will save that part for July 14th, okay? I will save their amazing story. But I will say this, every time they talked about the remarkable way in which they came to know God, in which they came to know the mission, in which the way that the mission has impacted them, every time you tried to compliment them, they would go to God be the glory. Hallelujah. We heard that over and over again. And amen to that, by the way. To God be the glory. He was able to affect that home, which has been able to affect many, 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 many more homes. And Juan Carlos was a kid when they first, when that family first came to know Christ. And Juan Carlos, I want to say it's been 22 years. He has now been married um, by Benny, I believe. I think Benny did the, the wedding. Um, Juan Carlos has grown up, and now he has kids of his own. And now he is working at the mission spreading the gospel, preaching in Nicaragua. Amen. That's amazing, guys. That's absolutely incredible. And so then I'm looking at Matthew 6, and I see it finally. I can see that. I'm like, wow, this is what it looks like to not worry and to let God be in control. It's not exactly how I would want that to look like, but it's what God is doing in Nicaragua. And I love the idea that they're content and happy with that. You might say, well, they don't know any better. But I'm telling you that they're not dumb. They know better. They understand what Americans have. They see our money. They, they know. They get a look online. Um, I was shocked when I talked to the kids. And I'm thinking, okay, it's a primitive world. They don't have a whole lot. I'm trying to talk about baseball because that's a big thing. And I'm talking about the Astros, which are great. And I'm trying to indoctrinate them with that. And, uh, and I asked them, I said, well, what's your favorite game? And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to hear something about football or baseball. And they go, Minecraft. <laughs> like, what in the world? <laughs> well, you see, priorities are just a little different over there. They might not be able to afford your home. And you might not be able to afford a good flooring or uh, the, the walls or even a shower. I would like a shower. But they, have to, they need a phone because that helps them be safe and get around. And so they have a prioritized smartphones. And by the way, the, the cell service there is so much better than here. You could get cell service everywhere in Nicaragua. I don't, what are, what's up, America? Like, <laughs> seriously. Um, but the kids would borrow their phone from mom and dad and play Minecraft. That's how that happened. It's really a popular thing there. I say that because A, it's a really funny story, but B, they know what America looks like. They're able to get online. They're on Facebook. They're not dumb. But they have chosen to be content with what they have. Amen. And I'm 
wondering, are we, have we chosen to be content with what we have? Are we willing to follow God no matter what that looks like? Because if they can do it in Nicaragua, we certainly can here in America. I wanted to, if you, yeah. So I'm going to ask you today, my first reflection here is, do an honest assessment. You don't have to answer it out loud. You don't have to even know right now. But think through this. Where are you at in following the words of Jesus? Are you someone who worries too much? Are you someone who is putting too much priority in earning money, buying a home, paying off debt, trying to get the best job, making sure you're healthy, which is apparently something I really need to do, but sometimes you can go too far in that? Are you letting all of these worries get in your way of hearing Jesus' message? Don't let it be a distraction. Amen. Don't let it get in the way of you hearing God this morning. Right. The thing I was amazed about in Nicaragua was how primitive and simple, and that, primitive sounds bad, so I'm not going to say that word, simple. It's so simple. There wasn't a ton of tech. There wasn't a ton of complicated things. I love my apps, and <laughs> there was no apps for things. Everything was simple. In fact, it reminded me of Jesus because everything's agriculturally based. And in Jesus' words, I could hear them in a way I've never heard them because I'm literally reading the story and going, yeah, this looks like life over here. They're drawing water up from a well. <laughs> They're talking about pigs and cows. And on July 14th, I promise you, you'll hear a funny story about cows. Um, it is a part of their vocabulary, this simple way of living. And it feels to me like they hear the words of Jesus maybe a little bit stronger than we do. Where are you at today in following the words of Jesus? That's my first takeaway this morning. And I have one more takeaway for you this morning. And that is, we look at this verse, and, and I think that when we can breathe and relax and, and understand that God's in control, we might even... If you can believe that and embrace that and make that a part of your life, that is amazing. I want you to take that away today. But sometimes I think we look at that verse and go, well, God is faithful. And amen. Or to, as they would say, to God be the glory. And God will take care of you. But I believe that there's one more part of that verse that I would like to challenge you with today. And that is, God doesn't need any of us. He doesn't. God's all-powerful, all-knowing. He can do whatever he wants. And I never want to pretend that God needs me to do anything. But God wants you. And God wants me. And somehow, in his divine grace, he has decided that the way that he often will be faithful to people is by calling up people to be workers in his kingdom. He did it with the disciples. Jesus called a ragtag group of fishermen and people that had no business doing the word of God. Amen. And yet, 2,000 years later, however imperfect it is, the church exists. And we are here praising God. Amen. Could God have done it any way he wanted to? Sure. But he used 12 men. And he made them not fishermen, but fishers of men. And today, the reason why I called this, or I, I asked David to, to sing the song as the deer thirst, and why we sing it yet again, and I'm sorry, you three, if I know you're going to get tired of the song. Uh, the reason why I did that is because of the line that says, draw me deeper, Lord. I feel the words of Isaiah saying, Lord, send me. And here's the thing about the being deeper. What I love about that image is that every one of us is at a different point today. And if we are all in the proverbial pool, the pool of water, as the song suggests, some of us might just be walking around that pool. We're on the ground trying to decide whether if it's too cold to get in. Right? 
Some of us might have ventured enough to at least dip our toes in the very beginning of it. And, and we're just kind of feeling it out. Saying, well, I mean, I don't know. Let me, let me warm up to this. It's usually me and any pool we go to. Some of us are in the shallow end because we don't think of ourselves as strong swimmers. And we just need to be there for a little while and enjoy that shallow pool and just enjoy our time. And some of us get a little bit more adventuresome. <laughs> like my kids, always. They want to go into the deep end, even though I'm not even sure that they really should be in the deep end. They immediately want to go there. And, and some of us are in the deep end without even being good at it, but we want to be there. And others of us are really, really good swimmers. And that's just where we live. We live in the deep end. And if you haven't caught on by now, I'm not talking about water and I'm not talking about swimming. I'm talking about your spiritual life today. I'm talking about where you are with God. Some of us are just trying to fill it out, seeing if we want to follow Jesus. Some of us are, we're in, we show up, we go to church, we do some things. But that's about as deep as it gets right now. And some of us are fully committed, just a part of everything, on the deep end, talented, are a part of it. And here's what I want to tell you. I, I don't know if Jesus is super concerned right now with where you find yourself on that spectrum. I do know what he does want from you, though. He wants you to go deeper. If you're in the shallow end, take one more step. If you're in the deep end and you think, I've got this. I'm really good at this. I've made a difference. Amen. God be the glory that you've done that. But that's not where you stop. God's calling you to something deeper. And I, I can't answer what that looks like for you today. And I, I don't know what deeper looks like. I told the kids that we, I had a version of this on a Wednesday night last week. And I said, you know, guys, some of you might be called to be missionaries. And if that's the case, amazing. But some of you might not be. Some of you might be called to live a very normal life here in Somerville, South Carolina. Some of you might be called to a place that you have no idea where that's even at and you never thought you would ever end up there. It's kind of how I feel about living here in South Carolina. <laughs> um, but to God be the glory. Because I can be content and happy as long as I know that I am putting my trust and faith in God our Father in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And if that means I stay here in Somerville, South Carolina for the rest of my life, then God be the glory. And if that means that I'm not called to do some things that I thought I was called to, then that's okay. It's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about you figuring out what's the talent, strengths, the calling that you have been called to. Calling is not just a word for ministers. Calling is a word for every Christian. Because we are all called to serve God. And so what I want to leave you with today is, first of all, if you, if you find yourself today being someone who worries, being someone who is sh stressing about uh, health, finances, politics, our, our nation, um, just anything, I would, I would really encourage you to hear the words of Jesus again. Ask for prayers. Ask for support. We are all in this together. The number one thing that they stress over in Nicaragua, I kept on hearing from people, is that A, God, and B, family. And family to them, I, I love it because I feel the same way. Family to them goes beyond biological ties. Family is the people who are committed to a common cause. And that cause is to serve Jesus Christ. At this church, we have our mission statement that we build relationships and that we strengthen faith. And I pray that every single one of us takes that to heart. And this, this year, that would be something we really put our focus on. That we simplify our lives. Throw out the things that are getting in the way. Make sure that there is no distractions for hearing God's word. That we truly are putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This morning... If you need the prayers of the church to recommit yourself to God, I, I, I urge you to do that. Um, whether that's publicly, whether that's finding someone you trust, please recommit yourself to God. Put your trust in Him. He will offer you the peace which surpasses all understanding. 
And, and if you haven't done that, if you are by chance online or, or visiting with us today and you have never committed yourself to God, I, I don't know what else to tell you as a sales pitch than showing you that even in, the, in abject poverty, your life can have meaning and purpose and hope and ultimately eternity with God our Father. And I implore you, please, see someone about what it looks like for you to become a part of this family. Uh, I will offer that uh, invitation as we uh, stand and, and sing the song that has been selected.